right, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our penultimate, our second last program in our epic Cross Canada virtual road trip series. I'll explain a little bit about more about what that is in just a second, but I'll start by saying if you are here for the very first time, we are exploring by the seat of your pants and we are all about bringing conservation, adventure and science into classrooms around the world. We do about 50 broadcasts every single month and everything we do goes live to our YouTube channel. So if you want to check it out three weeks down the road, 10 years down the road, you can head there and see this broadcast anew. It'll be a lot of fun, I promise. Uh, and today we are continuing on our most epic series of the year. For the last three years, we've had the immense privilege of getting to partner with the amazing teams at Park Canada and Canadian Geographic Education for a really incredible series known as the Cross Canada Virtual Road Trip. We've had kids join us from coast to coast to coast. We've had stories shared from coast to coast to coast. In the last couple of days alone, we've had Fortress of Lewisburg talking about their amazing historical site. We've had the Red Bay National Historic Site and UNESCO World Heritage Site in Labrador. We're going a little west of that today to go to a place that we've never had the chance to visit for a really special location and a place that uh, I hope for a lot of our students is entirely new and exciting, and that is the Mingan Archipelago National Park Reserve. This is on the north shore of Quebec, about 500 kilometers removed from any of the other broadcasts we've done all year, and I'm so thrilled to dive in to talk about the really special place that they have there, and particularly puffins. I've seen puffins off the coast of Newfoundland. They are one of the most charismatic and wonderful birds on this planet, and today from Amber, we are going to learn a lot about them, this special place, and so much more. So please do let us know where you're joining from in the chat on YouTube. We've got a bunch of amazing classes joining live. 1,340 kids that registered for today's program. So thank you all so much for being here. And without further ado, Amber, unmute your mic. Come on in. Let's dive in. I'm so excited to learn about this special place. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Jesse. Are you ready to get started? We are so ready to get started. I can hardly stand it. I'm really like, I'm literally on the edge of my seat, exploring by the seat of my pants. Let's do it. <laughs> awesome. So today we're going to be talking about puffins and seabirds of Ido Perroquet. I'm so happy to be here with you today. As Jesse said, my name is Amber and I'm a public education officer with Parks Canada. My job is very simple. I get to talk about super interesting subjects with the young and the young at heart. I'm very lucky to work at the beautiful, the incredible Mingan Archipelago National Park Reserve. And for those that don't know, an archipelago is a grouping of many islands. And here in the Mingan Islands, we have about 1,000 islands of all different sizes. So for those wondering, where is the Mingan Archipelago? It's on the North Shore of Quebec, where we see that first purple arrow up top pointing to the number two on the map. And before we keep going, I'd like to point out that there are 11 First Nations in, in Quebec and the Mingan Archipelago National Park Reserve is very pleased to collaborate with the Inu communities of Iquanitsip and Mutakwan. Another thing you'll notice looking at this map is that Parks Canada is made up of many parks across Quebec and across Canada. And uh, it's national parks, it's marine conservation areas and historical sites that are all set up to protect nature and history. And for those joining us from the United States, our, uh, our Canadian Park Service, it was created just a little bit, a couple years before yours. Today, we are going to venture to one of our islands in the park, Ido Perroquet, to discover the fascinating lives of puffins and seabirds. So, my first question for you. How many species of birds do you think there are in the entire world? You can go ahead and write in the chat. How many species of birds in the entire world? What do you think? And I'll say too- a little bit of time to many... write in the chat how many species you think. Yes, we've got a bunch of uh, got amazing millions from Mrs. Millions. class. Yep, and then on YouTube, we've got Mr. Edwards, Miss Butts class, Miss Gale, the Arishinkov family, Miss Craig. We've got like 50 classes. It's very exciting. So it's uh, not millions. So it's a little bit less than millions. A thousand from Mrs. Collins Cardinals. We're getting yep. a little bit closer. 10,000. Well, grade three, five Riverside, you have the right answer. It is 10,000 species of birds in the entire world. Now, my next question for you, how many of those 10,000 species are marine birds? So we've got 10,000 in the entire world. How many of those 10,000 birds are considered marine birds? 
Amber, I'm going to give our YouTube 3,000. A little bit less than that. Let's see. YouTube classes, if you guys want to chime in too, we'd love to hear from you. We got some 2, great. 2,000. Got to keep going down. Let's see. 2,000. A little lower than this. Keep going. Great answers, guys. You guys are like on the ball today. All right. Our answer is actually 305. So again, grades 3, 5, Riverside, you're the closest. But we're still a little bit higher than the actual number. It's 305 marine birds in the entire world. Now, here at the Mingan Archipelago National Park Reserve, we're very lucky because of those 300 or so marine birds, we have 12 species that we can observe here at our park. We've got the double crested cormorant, the common tern, black guillemot, the Atlantic puffin, which we're going to discuss a lot today, the black legged kittiwake the great black back gull, the ring-billed gull, the herring gull, the razor bill, the arctic tern, and the common eider. Now, let's talk about puffins. What is a puffin? We also call them uh, sea parrots here, or sea clowns. Now, the puffin is a small bird that belongs to the Alcidae family. So that's a family that also includes razor bills and guillemots. They're black and white, and they kind of look like they're wearing a tuxedo a lot of the time. And they've got this big orange and black, very distinctive bill. And that's kind of why we call them sea parrots sometimes, because it looks like a, a parrot's bill. They're about one foot tall, so they're very, very, they're pretty small birds. And they're going to weigh about 300 to 500 grams. So that's about the same weight as three oranges, between two and four oranges, to be exact. But what is a seabird? So we just found out that we've got 10,000 birds in the world and we've got about 300 species of marine bird or seabird. Let's talk about what a seabird is. There's no one exact definition of a seabird. Generally, when we're discussing seabirds, they're a bird that spends the largest part of their lives at sea or birds that live and eat from the sea, whether that be from the coast or in the middle of the ocean. No matter what definition you want to use, all marine birds have one thing in common. Once a year, they're going to need to come to shore to nest. And here in the Mingan Archipelago, that's when we're going to see the puffins. They're going to come onto Ido Perroquet to nest and to lay their eggs. So what are the other characteristics of a marine bird? Let's look at those together. The first thing here, this is our little icon that we're going to use. This is our little, our little friend, the puffin, and we're going to use him to discover the different adaptations that marine birds have to have. So marine birds, they need to be able to drink water when they're out in the middle of the ocean. They need to be able to stay dry. Let's find out how they do that. The first thing that marine birds are going to have are webbed feet. Puffins need to know how to swim. It's really hard to swim with your socks on. Um, it's not a very good way to swim. So puffins, they have webbed feet like flippers that scuba divers will wear, and that's going to help them really easily swim in the water and be able to navigate well in the water as well. And if you see a puffin on dry land, it's very funny. They are, they're very clumsy. They're not very delicate. They're much better suited uh, to moving in the water. Our next adaptation that our puffin and other marine birds have to have is a beak. Now you might be thinking, well, don't all birds have beaks? Well, yes, they do. But marine birds and puffins are going to have a very special beak. They have a specialized beak. And this puffin is going to have a very big orange beak. And it's specialized to be able to transport multiple fish at a time. In that photo, we can see he's got lots of different, uh, many different fish that are all in his beak. So he can carry an average of 10 fish at a time. When he goes out to go fishing for those fish, he's going to be able to carry more fish at a time to bring it back to his, uh, to his den instead of having to go back and forth one fish at a time. And there's actually these very small hooks on the inside of his bill. And they work kind of like fork prongs to keep everything in place. It's really, really cool. Their big beak, it's also going to do something else. It's going to help them dig their den. So a den is a very long tunnel in the side of the cliff. 
And at the end of that den, after they've dug it out, that's where the female is going to lay her egg. Our next adaptation, black tipped wings. So most marine birds will have black edges to their wings because black and brown feathers tend to be more resistant. It's likely caused by something called melanin. So it's a dark pigment that colors their feathers. And in the case of the puffin, his entire wing is black. But you'll notice that in most marine birds, even seagulls, just the edge tends to be black and it's so that it uh, gets used down a little less quick. Sometimes their whole bodies can be black or dark, but uh, species like the alcids, cormorants, gulls, they all have that black wingtip. The wingtip needs to be more resistant because more often than not, it's going to be the first part of the wing that's touching or skimming the surface of the water. So having uh, a tougher wingtip is definitely going to help them. The next adaptation they will have is an oil gland. Their feathers have to be waterproof. They're spending most of their lives in the water. So puffins will have an oily secretion that comes from a gland on their back end. Marine birds will spend long parts of their day oiling their feathers with the help of their beak and that's going to help keep them water resistant. A salt gland is our next adaptation. Have you ever accidentally swallowed seawater or salt water? It doesn't taste very good and you can't drink it, yuck. However, marine birds, they're able to drink the salty water with the help of their salt gland. Unlike mammals like us who process salt through their kidneys, puffins will eliminate salt using the salt gland on their head. Now they've got it behind their eye, it's close to their eye on the inside of their head. All the extra salt that they have in their system after drinking salt water is going to be brought to their salt gland through their blood, treated in the salt gland, and then eliminated through their nostrils. The liquid, it's a very salty liquid, it's going to drip down their beak. And they're going to get rid of that salty liquid by shaking their head like this. So sometimes when you see marine birds and seagulls shaking their head, it's probably because they're trying to eliminate salt from their nostril that was just treated from their salt gland. Now that salt that's being eliminated with the salt gland, it's about one and a half times more salty than seawater. So it's a very high concentration of salt that they're getting rid of. This is one of my favorite adaptations. And in that picture, we see a little green arrow and that's pointing to the puffin's nostril. So you can see those two little holes, those are the puffin's nostrils where the salt is going to be coming out and dripping down their bill. Our next adaptation and our final adaptation we're gonna be talking about today is a warm down. Now these marine birds are often living in very cold water. Here in the Mingan Archipelago, that water temperature is often around four to seven degrees Celsius, even in the summertime. So the birds have to be able to really keep their heat. The dense feathers of marine birds, they make an excellent thermal isolant. That means that they hold heat like a winter cold. So to recap, and here we're looking at the puffin's cousin, the razorbill, which is another marine bird we find here in the archipelago. The seabirds will have a specialized beak, they'll have webbed feet, black tipped wings, a salt gland to get rid of salt, warm down, and an oil gland to be able to stay water resistant. Now, I wanted to show you this picture because this is a picture on land of Ilo Perroquet. And you can see that there's a lighthouse on this mysterious small island. And it's on the cliffs of these islands that we're going to find puffins. And they've started arriving already. We've had our conservation out in the field this week and the puffins have already started arriving, getting ready to prepare their dens to lay their eggs. Now, I hope you're ready because I have a little bit of a test for you guys. We are going to look together at four different sounds or calls, songs, whatever you'd like to call them, of four different marine birds. So teachers, if you wanna get out a little piece of paper or write down on the white bird, the white bird, excuse me, uh, you can write down these four species name, the Atlantic puffin, the razorbill, black-legged kittiwake, and the herring gill. One at a time, I'm going to play you 
a sound of a bird and you're going to have to try and match it to what bird you think it belongs. Give you just a minute to set up. Yep, we're ready. We're ready, Amber, we're excited. <laughs> All right, I hope everyone's ready. Here we go with our first bird song. Nice. This is number one. Excellent. Time for number two. That's a little different. <laughs> number three, this is number three. Nothing good. <laughs> the terror bird. Huh. We're starting to get our first guesses on YouTube and StreamYard, which is fantastic. We got one more bird to come still. I sounded like that this morning when I woke up. And finally, number all right i hope you had enough time to hear all four of those is there anyone that you'd like me to repeat that we're not sure about? Go ahead and write in the chat if you'd like me to repeat one of them. One, two, three, or four. Hmm. YouTubers, you can come on in with this too. Repeat number two, please. All right. Let's repeat number two. Number two. All right, are you ready for the answers? Oh, we see Mrs. O, all right, we've got number one, Herring Girl, Puff and Raisin Bowl, Kid Away. Good guesses. Any other classes want to put your guesses in the chat? Yeah. We've got some YouTubers chiming in as well, which is great. And I promise you, all four of those sounds that you heard, they do come from birds. Some of them sounded a bit like a chainsaw or even a cow at one point, but all of those came from those four birds, I promise. All right, let's find out the answers. So the answer is the herring gull for number one. I'll play you that again. Here's the herring gull. All right, that was our herring gull. Now these aren't these weren't completely in order. So number one was the herring gull. Number two actually was the razor bill. I mixed that one up by accident. But this is the razor bill. After that, number three was the puffin. Here's the puffin.
finally, the black-legged kittywick, he was number four. <laughs> So sorry about that. The two and three were mixed up. So it was actually number two was the razor bill and number three was the Atlantic puffin earlier. All right, let's keep going. The puffin sounds horrifying. He sounds really strange. I agree. The puffin sounds very funny and it's a very loud noise coming out of such a small bird. It sounds a lot like a cow and it always makes me laugh whenever I hear him, <laughs> whenever I hear the noise of the puffin. It's very, very funny. The next thing we're going to talk about is what we can do to help seabirds. How, how do we protect puffins? How do we protect seabirds? Now, here at Parks Canada, learning about marine birds, including Atlantic puffins, helps to better understand and protect them. In this photo that you see here, one of our conservation team members is holding a puffin, and that was for a project that took place last summer. They're on Ilo Perroquet in this photo. And what they were doing was taking measurements of all the different birds, putting bands around their leg to tag them. And even on some of them, they installed small GPS units on their back, really, really small GPS units. And that was to track their movements. This helps better understand their feeding and their wintering grounds. But there's lots of things that you can do too to help protect puffins, to help protect seabirds. Many of you I know are joining from Ontario, from Montreal, from Quebec City. Now, the St. Lawrence Gulf, where Ilo Perroquet and where these puffins are located, is in St. Lawrence watershed. So all that water from Lake Ontario, from Toronto, is coming down and will flow through here eventually. All of these water systems are connected. So actions that you are doing, whether you're uh, in Manitoba, in Saskatchewan, in Ontario, or even if you're in the United States, will all reach the ocean. They're all connected to these water systems. So making sure that you're disposing of your waste correctly, recycling items that you can recycle, and even doing beach cleanups is a great way to get involved um, and to help out the beach and the water ecosystems that are local to you. It can be on the side of a stream, on the side of a lake, on the side of the ocean, wherever you are, everybody can participate in these kinds of cleanups to help protect puffins and seabirds. Now we've reached my favorite period. It's time for questions. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have about puffins. Fantastic. Well, Amber, I'm, I'm not sure if you can hear me with your setup right now, but if you want to come out of screen share and you can see us have a bit of a conversation, we've got a bunch of live classes. With now, us. in the background, Jesse, I don't know if you'd like me to share uh, a video from Ilo Perroquet and I can put that on while we're answering questions. Sure. Does that sound like a good idea? Yes, if you can hear me, which I'm not sure you can. <laughs> but looks like Jess is connecting. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my presentation and I'm going to start sharing Perfect. a Just video a that's from Ilo Perroquet and you'll be able to see the puffins we have here. And I'll put that on while we're answering questions. Perfect. Um, go ahead and share. I'm going to put Amber in the background really, really quickly while she's doing that. If classes could let me know if you can hear me, I checked YouTube a minute ago and I was audible, so I'm hoping that that's still the case. Um, otherwise, this is going to be an interesting Q&A attempt. Uh, but Amber's got this queued up, which is great. Um, fantastic, folks. There's a question Amber's from Mrs. Fax, grade five class. Yeah. So is this puffin species the same as the one that lives in Iceland? We believe they also have the Atlantic puffin as well. Excellent question. Yes, so it is the same species of bird that lives in Iceland. It is the same, but the birds that we have here that are coming to summer here are the same ones that are going to go in summer in Iceland. Okay, Amber, can you see me? <laughs> oh, yeah, we wanna, we wanna get into that audio-wise. So here we have a view from the cliff bottom of Ido Perroquet. You can see that just in the background there, we've got a, uh, a lighthouse. And from this vantage point, you can see the puffins flying in and out of their dens. And you can see how small they are. Uh, let's see. I'm going to try and just flag Amber so that she knows she we can't Jesse, I, hear I'm not sure if you're trying to speak. It looks like you're... Yeah, you need to change up your audio. Oh, looks like I can't hear any of you. Oh, no. hang on a second. How do I change this? Maybe exit. Sorry about uh, that. That's okay. All good. 
Live classes, I'm coming to you guys momentarily. YouTubers, you've already shared like a gazillion questions, which is amazing. Um, change um, your audio. Um, hmm. uh, let's see. I'm going to get Ember to exit screen share, and we're going to see how this goes. Bear with us, folks. We have a little bit of leeway time. We got a really, like, a huge time for uh, Q&A, which is great. Exit screen share, Amber. Let's see. We're going to get her to do that. I did note for our classes on YouTube as well, and for our StreamYard classes, we already have more questions than we can possibly answer in one broadcast, so be sure to keep the questions from your class, and we'll see if we can get them to Amber after the, uh, the program's done and get all your questions answered. Um, StreamYard classes, I will come to you live, okay? You don't need to share in the chat, but it's going to be a little confusing to navigate if you're doing that. Uh, so we will come to you in just a sec if we get Amber back. I think she's just rejiggering it all. While we're waiting, I will note I've already put this in the YouTube chat and here. If you want to learn more about the Mingan Archipelago, so much more to discover than we could possibly do in one 22-minute broadcast. So do check that out when you're done. There's much more to see. You get the chance to go in person if you're in Ontario, Quebec, close by, New Brunswick. Um, be sure to. It's a really, really special part of the world as we've had the chance to see today. All right, tweeting on Amber. Uh, sorry for the little tech hiccup, uh, but we really appreciate all of you guys joining in today. We have had a few questions uh, on YouTube that I can feel while we're waiting for Amber to come back. Notably, how many puffins are in the world? Millions. So a lot of the creatures we feature here at Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants and in this park series have been endangered or vulnerable in some fashion. Puffins are not among them, fortunately. So the uh, North Atlantic puffin colony population in Newfoundland, Quebec, Iceland, and more uh, is in the, the many millions of breeding pairs, which is fantastic. We've had questions about if they can vocalize like parrots. They cannot. There are only a few birds in the world that can actually make sounds that are, are sort of audible and, and talk like a person can. Uh, puffins are not among them. We're going to have Amber back now, in theory. Amber, welcome back. Hello. Can you hear oh, me? I can hear you fine. You can hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Cool. Okay. I think when you were screen sharing, it was just cutting off your audio. So as much as the video would be super cool, we'll get that to some classes later so that we can have a nice Q&A together, okay? No problem. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to head to our Riverside crew first in New Brunswick. If you guys want to come on in and share a question live, uh, you're yes, in the three. broadcast. Hey, three Hello. guys. Hi. Hey, guys. <laughs> okay, so Riverside, if you sit down and then uh, put up your hand if you do have a question, and I will come to you. Um, Paisley, you've got a question. You ask it. You can look at them and ask it. Hey, Hazel. What's your question, Paisley? How can you tell if it's a boy or a girl? Great question, Amber. <laughs> Very good question. Now, from the outside, puffins that are girls and boys look almost identical. So you have to be really, really good at spotting the difference. And scientists will have to really look at them very closely to look at their anatomy to be able to tell if they're a boy or a girl. First question. Thanks, Hazel. We're going to head to Mr. Shaddock's class in Chalk River, uh, 678. So Come on in, guys. Yeah, of course you remember me. Of course. Um, of course. Obviously. Um, what are the puffins prey? Ooh, what do they eat? What do they eat? What do they eat? Do they eat? Excellent question. Uh, they tend to eat what's available as far as small fish go. So here, it's often sandlands and uh, other little types of uh, small schooling fish that we'll find here in the archipelago. And so in that picture that we saw in the presentation, the puffin had about six, seven sand lance in its beak. So it's typically very small schooling fish. This sounds ridiculous, but I only saw a puffin picture without the fish when I was like 22. Like every picture shared of puffins for years has these fish. And I was like, what is that weird structure in their face? And it's like, it's not, it's what they're eating. Um, <laughs> guys miss lou's class milton come on in grade fours and take us away nice to see you again <laughs> hey no, 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 wait okay wait okay wait i have a question okay <laughs> um if a bird if a bird has a baby can the baby ha have a different what's it called again species of bird than the father and the mother so can a can two puffins have a baby that isn't a puffin? I can feel this one. No. <laughs> <laughs> you got that right, Jesse. <laughs> Easy. 
Yes. So, I mean, one of the ways that we can actually distinguish species in the world is that they do have young that are the same. Sometimes two different species can breed and make a hybrid. We have that with mules, which is a donkey and a horse mixing together, or a tiger and a lion can make a liger. But with two adult puffins, it would be really freaky. It would change all of biology forever. Millions of scientists would be out of work like that if that could happen. So I'm glad we aren't in a world that's so crazy without rules. Um, Miss Pratchett's class, grade fives. Come on in, guys. Unmute your mic. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi there. Okay, Hi there. we have some questions. We have a question. Um, yeah, we have a question. Okay, just wait. Isha's going to come to the camera. Hey, Isha. Oh, too bad. Oh, too bad. Oh, too bad. Oh, too bad. Oh, too when were puffins first discovered? Ooh, when did we find Ooh, our first puffin? That's dinner? a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> well, we can go. You know what? There actually is a, an answer you can sort of come to from this because puffins are in the North Atlantic. So we've got islands that exist with puffins. People start getting to about 20,000 years ago. So there, there's a, a vague date, but it's not in the historical record. Scientifically described sometime in the 15, 1600s when we're going out and actually sort of cataloging birds for the first time. I always like when we get questions like this. Very cool. Miss Collins' class, come on in, Carlos, and take us away. Hey, guys. Why are puffins main prey? Ooh, oh yes, main prey. And then I'm gonna uh, change this too. So we talked about the prey a little bit. If they have got a favorite one, Amber, tell us. And then does anything eat the puffin as well? So the main prey here is probably the Atlantic sand lens. That's probably the main prey that they're eating here. And as far as prey goes, unfortunately, there are uh, some other birds that will come in and try and eat typically baby puffins. Baby puffins are a lot easier to catch than the adults. And so we've got like the great black back gum. They're pretty predatory. So they might try and eat some baby puffins from time to time. Great. We've got um, uh, Burlington class four or fives. If you want to unmute your mic, I can come to you, Ms. Baltica's class. Uh, just let me know if you want a question and I'll just turn that on and I'll come to you. We've got a bevy of YouTube classes. In fact, Amber, I may have thrown you under the bus and said that you might be willing to answer questions after the fact, but we've already got like 60 questions on YouTube. Oh my right? goodness. Wow. So we're going to take as many as we can over the next few <laughs> And then I'll do a second round with all our live groups. Uh, Miss, uh, let's see. Oh, good one for you. Miss Romaniak's class wants to know, why are puffins called puffins? Do we have an answer for this? <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. Pu why are puffins called puffins? I don't know why they have the name puffins, but here in the Mingan Archipelago, um, there's not very much English that's spoken. It's mostly French. In French, puffin is macaron moine or calculo perroquet de mer. And perroquet de mer loosely translates to sea parrot. Why do we call them sea parrots? Well, it's because of that big orange beak that looks like a parrot. So I can tell you a little bit why we call them that here on the North Shore of Quebec. Very, very cool. Um, let's head to Miss Smith's class, joining us in Stony Plain. There, Miss Smith's class has joined us for like 8,000 million broadcasts this year. They should get like a record. Amazing. Um, how old are puffins when they leave their mom? And this is an interesting question, just generally for bird biology. I like this. Yeah, they're very young. So the baby puffins aren't going to spend, uh, they're not going to spend that much time with mom and dad. They're going to start hatching uh, around May, June. And by the end of the summer, they're going to separate from their parents. Typically, after they're done hatching here in the Main Archipelago, they'll be with their parents for a couple months. And after that, they separate. Yep. We've got a question from Miss Your Amber. This is like the fastest Q and A ever. I we need to bring you on for more broadcasts. This is great. <laughs> Leonardo's class. I have a unique answer to this question, but I want to give it to you first. One of the students wants to know if there are puffins in Italy. <laughs> oh, not that I know of. I don't think that there are any uh, populations of wild puffins in Italy, as far as I know. There may be some in zoos or in uh, wildlife, like conservation places in Italy. But as far as I know, I don't know of any wild populations in Italy. No populations, but we did have a program and I can't for the life of me remember who this was specifically. I'll try and track it down for classes, but it was about puffin migrations. And basically they put uh, like a thing on puffins to see where they go uh, sort of virtually. And they found that like 99% of them went to like Scotland or somewhere like dreary and foggy and rocky, but one puffin went to Italy and it just went to like the south coast. And I was like, what's the deal with that puffin? That puffin's got, uh, you know, knows what it's doing. Um, 
We're going to take a couple more from YouTube and then I'm going back to our Riverside crew. Let's see. So many great questions. Oh, Miss Storm's class. Uh, great name for our program today. How long can puffins live and can puffins fly? Great question. So puffins will live about 20 years and the oldest known recorded puffin was 36 years old. So that was a very old puffin, but the average is about 20 years. Now, can they fly? Yes, they can fly. And I always laugh when I see them flying. Um, they tend to like the cliffs here at Ilo Perraquet and possibly because they have an easier time starting getting off the ground because they can kind of just jump off and they're already in the air. And they kind of look like little flying footballs. Their wings flap really, really, really fast. They're very comical to watch fly. They are. I've had the chance to see a puffin colony with about 100,000 off the coast of Newfoundland, and they're just a, such a special bird to see that many birds around you. There's not many other circumstances in Canada or the world where you get that chance. So I hope our students get the chance to see your puffin someday if they leave your archipelago. Um, we're heading back to our live class, and I will take some more from our YouTube friends, but we are whipping through these. Three Fives, Riverside, come on back in. Hey. Hello. Um, what happens if a puffin gets stranded in the ocean? It gets tired. Or tired. If it gets tired? tired? Great question. If it gets tired, it's going to take a rest. It's going to sleep. Even when it's on the surface of the water, they're able to rest. They're able to sleep a little bit. These puffins are absolutely incredible. They're spending most of their lives out on the water. So they're very used to being out in rough conditions, in cold, uh, in big waves. Most of their lives, they're going to be out far out far out to sea, not taking rest on shore. It's mostly just during the nesting period that they're going to come back and rest on shore. So they're able to rest even when they're out in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, great question, guys. Um, I'm going to head to Mr. Shattuck in just a second, but I want to show that I'm always willing to do this. Uh, Mr. Edwards class, yes, you can get a shout out on camera. If you ask for it, I will, you know, ask and you shall receive. This is half the fun of exploring by the seat of your pants. So welcome in in Fort McLeod. Um, Mr. Shadows class, six, seven, eight, uh, come on back in. Hey guys. Back in. Hey guys. How do puffins learn to hunt? Do they learn Ooh. from their parents at Ooh. a very young age? Yeah. Great question. So when they're very, very, very small, those puffins are going to be fed completely by their parents. Their parents are going to bring in those little fish and leave them in the dens for the puffins. And eventually they're just going to instinctively know that, okay, mom and dad aren't going to feed me anymore. Time to go out, try and catch my own food. And fingers crossed, they're going to be able to do it on their own. Great question, guys. Miss Lou's class with a student that's so close to the camera is just shirt right now. Uh, welcome <laughs> to the Hi. How much puffins are there in the world? How many puffins on earth, Amber? I don't know. I actually looked this up while you were waiting because it was one you of did? my questions. Yeah, so it's it's millions of breeding pairs. There's a lot of puffins in the world. They're fortunately not a species that's in any danger of extinction or really endangerment right now, which is great. Um, as long as we make sure that their homes survive. And that's the nice thing with puffins. Habitat loss is the biggest cause of animal endangerment. And a lot of the places that puffins live aren't really places that people want to live. They're not places that we can farm. And so because of that, they haven't been under near as much threat as some of the more mainland species that we use for any number of industrialization or farming or more. So I'm really glad we got that question. Ms. Bratches class, I'm coming to you, uh, and then I'm going to take a couple more from YouTube, and I'll wrap up with one class at random after that. Uh, Ms. Bratches, welcome to Winnipeg. Hey. Hi there. We have another question. Um, why do puffins look like penguins? <laughs> Great. Why do they look like penguins? That's a really good question. Kind of like, why do two dog species look alike? Now, probably very, very far back in the evolutionary chain, we see that these characteristics were advantageous for multiple species of birds, having maybe those colorations and puffins, actually. They are very, very closely related to another species of, of birds here in the Mingan Archipelago that we call Pritz Fangwai, or little penguins. Those are our razor bills. And those initially were found before the true penguins. So those penguins down in Antarctica, they were found afterwards than the pits penguin that we have here on the North Shore. Convergent evolution. So this is something that you talked about. We actually get this variation of this question a lot. Species will tend to look like other species in completely different parts of the globe that share the same ecological niche. So if you're doing the same thing, if you're hunting for fish under the water, if you need to catch things on the wing, you'll develop a body shape and sometimes even the coloration looks like something. 
For what it's worth though, some penguins are as tall as you guys are in grade four or five. So very different than our puffins, which are about this big. There are penguins that are like four and a half feet tall and 70, 80 pounds. Uh, that's a very different kind of bird entirely. A uh, few more minutes before we wrap up. I'm gonna take a few from YouTube and then I'm gonna go to Mr. Shaddock's class for our last question. Uh, let's see, Mr. Cohen's class, Edmonton. Uh, we've got, oh, they've had a bunch of questions. We've covered that one. Oh, I wanted to come to you guys. Let's see. Oh, we got a, everyone wants to know about lifespan of puffins. There's so many questions on lifespan. I like this. Our homeschool Arishan Call family wants to know how big are their eggs and do they mate for life? I love those two questions. Unfortunately, I don't have an egg here with me, but they're just slightly bigger than a chicken egg. They're about that big and they're very similar in color to kind of the standard grocery store chicken egg they're like a uh, a bit creamier white color and those puffins are going to only lay one egg per pair per wow. season so very very important that we try and protect those dens protect those eggs because if that one egg doesn't work out well that couple for that season doesn't have a baby and right. yes they do mate for life so the pairs of puffins we have here and most populations of puffins actually they do tend to stick together and here in the Mingan archipelago they tend to come even back to the same den that they used very cool that's actually interesting as a with a biology background a lot of marine birds do mate for life penguins do albatross do um i don't know if that's a universal thing but that's a really interesting fact i guess given their life histories i'd be curious if, what the science is behind that uh, Addison in Miss Higgins' class wants to know, does climate change have an impact on what the birds eat? And then after this, we will go to Mr. Shaddix for the final question. If anyone has more questions, email them to us or I'll pass along Amber's email if she's willing and we can inundate her with all these questions <laughs> after we're done. But climate change. Absolutely. And that's a great question, Addison. Does climate change affect what puffins are eating? Now, indirectly and directly, yes, because depending on the conditions every year in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, depending on the temperature, um, on all kinds of different factors, fish species may have better uh, population sizes, they may come at a different time of the year. So depending on what's available for them to eat and how much of it's available for them to eat, the puffins are going to have to figure out how they're going to feed that year. So based on these trends, the puffins are going to have to adapt as to what and when they're eating these different species. It's a pretty safe answer uh, in universal biology, no matter where you're going, no matter what species you're talking about, climate change is having an impact. It really is changing the, the habitats, the distributions, the predator prey interactions everywhere on planet earth. Um, and in a huge way with people as well. Like we're, we're this is the, the defining issue of our time. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm really glad when we get questions on climate change. So thanks guys. Uh, Mr. Shadows class, one final question to wrap up. And I will note again, if you guys want to learn more about this amazing place, I have so many banners on my screen. The Mingan Archipelago National Park uh, Reserve uh, website is here. Check that out. We've only got one more program in our Cross Canada virtual road trip. It's very bittersweet. And that is on uh, tomorrow, actually, the 19th at 11. Visit the Green Gables. Check that out. Yeah, wherever, wherever we're pointing on the screen, uh, I really encourage you to check that out as well. Mr. Shadow's class, Shadda's wrap class, us up. Wrap hey, guys. Up. hey, guys. Hey, guys. Um, what inspired you to work with puffins? Yes. <laughs> Your personal story, Amber. Why are you here? <laughs> I'm here because I love puffins, and I love sharing everything about puffins. <laughs> I, I'm so glad, but we've had a bunch of classes ask about how people end up with these careers. And I want to note, like as someone who's had the chance to work with so many amazing park staff, not just this year, but over the last year, you will never meet a more enthusiastic group of people than Parks Canada employees. You guys are like, live and breathe the stuff that you have the chance to share. You're so enthusiastic. You're so knowledgeable. Um, so thank you, Amber, for this amazing presentation today and uh, for sharing this passion, because it's been so much fun hanging out with you. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you to everyone who joined today. Uh, it was so wonderful to be able to share a little bit about marine birds and to share about puffins. Hopefully one day you'll be able to come and visit us on the North Shore here at the Mingan Archipelago National Park Reserve. I can just like jump out of the, the harbor and corner brook here and like swim across to you. I might do that when we're done. A little dangerous swim. <laughs> I will note for our classes too, our third partner in this amazing series, Canadian Geographic, they've got an amazing competition. So you guys can just highlight what you learned today and have the chance to win some really, really cool prizes when you're done. I'll make sure all our registered classes have that link when you're done, but please do submit. We'd love to have you take part. Uh, Amber, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. So our Riverside crew, Mr. Shadow's class, Mr. Shadow's class, thank you everybody. Thank you everybody. Thank you everybody. Thank you everybody.